I want to talk to you today about uh, Ruby Macros, which is this uh, system that I created for uh, uh, enabling uh, deep metaprogramming with Ruby. Um, and now, uh, the idea is to be able to manipulate your syntax trees uh, at parse time and change them pretty much in any way you want. Um, <clears throat> if, you're, uh, if you grew up as a C programmer like me, you may be thinking of macros as uh, this kind of macro, uh, C preprocessor macros. Um, this is not the same thing, really. It's, it's sort of the same general idea, but the C preprocessor is very limited in what it can do. It's a, a fairly simple textual substitution scheme. Uh, it can't, uh, it, the, the language in which you write ma macros in C is not Turing complete, and, and you quite quickly run up against the limit of things that you can do. Uh, what I'm really talking about here are Lisp macros. Um, Lisp has a very powerful macro system, and um, that's what I'm trying to emulate. It's difficult to get to the, the level of complete uh, integration uh, with macros that Lisp has because of the nature of Lisp. Um, in Lisp, code is data and data is code, and that's just a really natural uh, flow between the two. In any other language that's not Lisp, that's basically impossible to do. But I try to get as close as I can. I think I got maybe 90% 90, 90 of the way there. Um, so here's an example of a really useless macro which adds two things together. Um, and this shows I had to invent several new syntactical constructions in order to achieve the effect that I was going for. Um, this shows all three of the new syntactical constructions. Um, first of all, we have this macro keyword. Um, so uh, the, the keyword macro introduces a macro, and macro definitions look syntactically just like method definitions. Um, in fact, in many ways, a macro is a method. Um, it just runs at parse time instead of at runtime. Um, uh, and, you know, so basically it's, it's a macro. It, it looks like a method definition, but instead of def, you have a macro. Um, but inside of the macro, uh, typically you will have a form. Um, that's this parenthesis thing, but it's got a colon on the front. Um, a form is a way of quoting your code, and uh, I'll explain it more in a little bit, a little bit more detail in a, in a couple of minutes. Uh, but for now, let's, let's just say that um, um, uh, every macro should have a form inside of it, and that form should mention the parameters to the macro up here. Um, and those parameters have to be escaped using the third of my new syntactical cons constructions, the form escape. Um, that's what this caret is. That's a unary operator. Um, and what it, what it does is it allows you to kind of break out of the form. Um, so anyway, the, the, this macro is in a whole lot of use. Um, what it does is um, just inline the addition operator, basically. So an expression like this, which is calling the macro, would be turned at parse time into an expression like this. Um, now, how does this work? Now, there's supposed to be some arrows there, but I think they ended up pretty faint. Um, but anyway, uh, um, what a macro does is uh, it returns, um, it runs at parse time, and so it does not have access to all of your regular Ruby objects. Um, um, it, it can't manipulate um, your arguments as objects per se. Um, it, it manipulates them symbolically instead as what are called S expressions. I think S is supposed to stand for symbolic. Um, and an S expression is basically a parse tree. Same thing. Um, so um, uh, what a macro does is actually it returns a parse tree which is then inlined directly into the code at the point where the macro invocation occurred. So in this example, we'd have a macro right here, and that would get substituted with uh, these two things that were returned in an S expression by, by the macro over on the right side. Uh, now, macros can also take arguments. Um, so, and again, uh, the arguments are S expressions. They're not regular Ruby objects with regular values. Um, so, uh, in, um, normally, for a normal function call, um, uh, Ruby would evaluate what is A plus B and come up with some object and it would pass that to the, to the macro or to the me method. Um, but uh, in uh, a macro situation, you cannot do that 
you don't have access to A and B yet. They haven't been defined at parse time. So uh, instead, you get a parse tree. You get an S expression for A plus B, and that gets passed as the argument there, and then the argument ultimately gets used somewhere in the macro in a form escape, typically. Uh, now let's talk a little bit more about forms, because forms are pretty important, even though they seem kind of boring in comparison to macros. Um, and so I've got an example of a form here in the middle, and I put it between a string and a proc uh, to sort of illustrate the, the concept that a form is kind of midway between a string and a proc. All three are sort of ways of quoting code. Um, a form is like a proc in that the contents of it are actually parsed. Uh, so if there's like a syntax error in it, the, um, uh, you'll find out about that at parse time. However, it's like a string in that the contents of it are not turned into instructions. They're not code yet. Um, they'll probably become code eventually when you use it for something. Um, but for the time being, uh, what's inside of the form is just data. It's just a tree. Um, so here's that same form again, and here's a representation of the tree that you get out of that form. Um, now this is, you should look at this as kind of like a YAML uh, data structure. Uh, it took me a long time to come up with this, um, uh, this method of representing uh, my trees. In fact, uh, uh, I had to get help from Roger Pack, who's sitting way up in the back there. And, uh, um, uh, so this is actually a pretty clean way to inspect your trees. Uh, what I had before was a lot, lot more ugly. Um, so basically this, for, this form turns into a tree um, that represents the code inside of the form. Um, at the top level, we've got uh, a call node. Um, uh, the actual class is call node, but I've left out all the extra stuff that you don't need to know about, like the node at the end of the, of the class name. Um, and it has a name, oh, that should be print instead of puts. I guess I didn't update that. Um, but, and then it also has a list of parameters, um, and that list contains a single string node, and the data in the string is hello. Um, now, here's an example of a form escape. This ultimately ends up creating the same form as before, the same as expression, um, uh, but it shows you uh, illustrates how to do a form escape. And I said that, that forms are kind of like strings, so form escapes are kind of like the string interpolation syntax, the crunch curly brace things. Um, and basically it allows you to escape out of your form back into regular Ruby mode temporarily. Uh, so you can, uh, um, uh, so what's, what's controlled by the form escape operator is, is um, actually interpreted um, at the time the form is evaluated. Um, and it, its contents are placed into the form at that point, kind of like the way macro expansion works. Um, now, uh, here's an example of a more realistic macro. I think this was the first macro I wrote. Um, you're all probably familiar with assertions from test unit. Um, this is an implementation of assert as a macro, uh, but this assert does a few more things than normal assertions do. Um, so, um, for instance, um, um, we're getting the, the uh, condition that's being asserted as an S expression here. Um, and then this part is checking to see if the condition is one of the known comparison operators. Um, and then if it is, it's picked apart um, into the left and right sides of the comparison and what operator it was. And we construct this nice error message here, which is a little complicated to explain, so I'm just going to show you how that works. Uh, is that big enough? Can everybody see that? That's not right. Now, before we do anything with assertions, we've got to set this debug variable. And then, you know, say I have a couple of variables. 
I can do an assertion like this. A naught equal B, we expect that to be true, so nothing happens when you run the assertion. But what happens when an assertion fails? We get an exception. Um, and the exception has an error message. And just like in test unit, the error message tells you what was on the left and right sides of the equal sign. We expected on the left side uh, an A, and on the right side there was a B. Or no, on the left side there was a 1, and on the right side there was a 2. Um, but the other thing that this, um, this, this is showing you is it's actually showing you the symbolic uh, form of the left and right sides. Um, so it's telling you that, um, yeah, what you wrote on the left side was A, and that value was 1, and, I, and on the right side you wrote a B, and that value was 2. That's something you can't do with a method-based assertion. You can't tell it um, what, what uh, you can't get it to inspect the, uh, uh, the image of the um, uh, condition that's passed to it. Um, and then, then the other interesting thing that's going on here with this assert, um, you know, notice I got this effect using regular assert. I didn't have to use assert equals. Um, using a macro assert, you don't need the assert equals, assert not equals, assert greater than, all of those, um, you know, dozens of crazy assertions that test unit has. You just need one assertion, assert. That's it. And, and you can use regular syntax inside of assert. You don't have to um, use some kind of special operator for equality. Um, now, the other thing I'm doing here is... Um, the whole thing is only enabled if this debug variable is set. If debug is not set, basically the assert returns nil, which um, is, does nothing. Um, if, if a macro returns nil, then uh, what occurred at that point in the parse tree is um, uh, it's, it's turned into nothing at all. There's not even a call to a method that does nothing. Um, it just vanishes. Um, now, uh, so basically you can disable your assertions. Um, now, there's not much cause for doing that in unit tests. I don't think that would be very useful. Um, but uh, the assertions are useful for a lot of things besides unit tests. Um, some people take assertions to uh, a great extreme, um, and there's a, a whole paradigm called uh, design by contract uh, where assertions are used extensively. I don't recommend going that far, but it is useful to be able to place assertions in your regular code um, and have uh, expectations in your mainline code that can get checked. And it's also nice to be able to turn those off in production mode, so you're not, not getting the, um, the cost of those extra checks. Um, all right, now let's talk a little bit about the syntax trees and the formats of those. Um, you know, basically we got a tree structure you know, here's an example expression, and this is the tree that it would turn into. Um, at the top, we've got a plus node. Its left side is an A, and its right side is this star node over here, um, which is left and right sides. Um, you know, and so this is just like an XML tree or, um, uh, you know, any other types of, of tree data you might might be able to, might have to deal with. Um, uh, the, the rig... Most of you may be familiar with um, parse trees, um, a, a different library for creating Ruby parse trees. Um, Ruby parser um, or, or uh, parse tree are um, uh, the most well-known um, parse tree implementation. Uh, I wrote my own parser. Um, I consider the output of it to be uh, greatly superior to uh, Ruby parser because um, uh, Ruby parser is trying to emulate the output of parse tree, and parse tree is basically uh, a hack that reached into the interpreter and pulled out some data structures from it that were never intended to be publicly accessible. Um, they they were you know the internal parse trees used by the interpreter, um, and they're just fine I'm sure for the interpreter, um, but um, they're kind of They've been munged a little bit. They're a little more distant from your original source code than you'd like. And they're, they're kind of funky. Um, uh, so unlike Ruby parser trees, red parse trees are actually object-oriented. The nodes are object. There's a node object. Um, it has a bunch of subclasses. And nodes contain other nodes. 
um, and that has a number of useful properties. Uh, for instance, the subnodes of a node have names instead of just numbers. Um, in parse tree, if you want to get the subnode, if you want to go from your some node that you've got to a subnode of it, you have to say node bracket zero or node bracket three or something, and you have to know that yeah, three means the rescue clause or something in whatever node you're looking at. In red parse, you can say node dot rescue or node dot params, node dot name, instead of having to to deal with all these numbers that they're they're not so meaningful. Um, and then finally, uh, red parse trees actually are very close to the original source form of, uh, of the, the code that created them. Whereas Ruby parser trees are, um, have, have been manip manipulated a little bit. Um, so for instance, um, uh, with Ruby parser, uh, rescues are, are handled in this strange way where there's multiple nodes that are, that are nested together. In red parse, there's, uh, the rescue is, is one clause that's attached to um, uh, various other, you know, the various types of nodes that can take a rescue. Um, um, in Ruby parser, um, parentheses, if they're present, um, have been uh, eliminated completely from the, the, the uh, resultant tree. In red parse, um, uh, the parentheses are a different node, and you can use that if you need it for anything. Um, in Ruby parser, operators are all turned into uh, calls for you, so you cannot distinguish a call from from an operator if it's if it's one of the overridable operators. Um, in Red parser, there's a separate operator type. Um, so I used to have this big description of all the node types in this at this point in my talk, but what I decided was it's actually better. Oops. It's better to show you some examples of some parse trees. Um, so you can use this red parse command if you have red parse installed um, to parse something and show you the result of it. Uh, so let's just look at a method call, for instance. Um, and we got this call node. It has a name and has some parameters. Um, uh, some flow control. There's an if node, and it has uh, subnodes that are called condition and consequent, uh, else ifs, and so forth. Uh, uh, how about a method definition? That will turn into a uh oh, what did I do wrong? Oh, it's not how you define a method, is it? Uh, it turns into you know a method node which has a body that has things in it. Um, and are there any other syntax examples that anybody wants to see what it looks like? Um, there is this long section. Did you have one? Ah, a, oh, oh, a round bass, okay. Like this. Um, okay, so that one looks just like the other one because it's still a method call. If you do another set, oops, you'll end up with a parent node in the output. Um, notice that it's taking a little while to run all these commands. The big disadvantage with red parse is how slow it is. Uh, that's something I hope to be able to fix someday. Um, so yeah, we got the uh, parens here, and it turned into a paren node down here. Now there is actually more information in these parse trees if you really want them. Um, you could turn on this verbose mode, and it tells you the positions of things and all kinds of funky attributes, like if there were parentheses in the, func in the function call and stuff like that, uh, which mostly you don't need to know about, and it's just extra useless details. Um, so, that's enough of that. Uh, so, I talked about how cool Ruby macros are. There are some problems. As I said, the red parse is slow, and because it has to, 
pre-process preprocess everything that's got a macro in it. Um, that means um, startup of a system that's using Ruby macros is going to be slow. It has to parse all those things using my slow parser. Um, if you've got a file that has macro definitions or anything like that, or, or uses macros, even if it doesn't define any, um, that file has to be imported into the interpreter using this special version of require, macro.require. You can't use the normal require. That's something I hope to have addressed fairly soon. Um, it would nice, be nice to be able to scope macros, to be able to say, I'm defining this macro within this class, and, it, and so only search for expansions for that macro within the class. Right now, you can't do that. All macros have to be declared in the global scope and are visible everywhere. Um, um, and then finally, if you're familiar with Lisp, um, um, Lisp has this thing called macro hygiene. Basically, um, uh, if there's any local variables defined in the macro expansion, uh, you want those to not interfere with local variables in its caller context. Um, so it has to rename the variables for you in this weird way. Um, I haven't implemented that yet. It's a little bit tricky. Um, and so um, uh, all macros at the moment are unhygienic, which is sl slightly dangerous. Um, now there's some other sort of advanced features of macros. Uh, macro can take a block. Um, so you can, you can pass a block to it. Again, it says an S expression. Then you access that block using the yield keyword, which doesn't have, so yield does not have the same semantics as, as you might expect uh, within a macro. Uh, incidentally, this macro is, um, is one that, that allows you to uh, make changes to local variables within the, the block, uh, which will be, um, and those changes will be hidden from, um, uh, from external callers. Um, um, macros can also have receivers. You access those with this receiver pseudo keyword. Um, that's not the way I, would, I really want to do it. I think I'm going to change it so that you can use uh, self instead. Uh, that will probably make a little bit more sense. Um, uh, oh, and this is the sort of uh, uh, RSpec-y version of the assert macro I showed earlier. Um, now, here's a macro that I'd like to write, but I haven't written yet. Um, it would be nice to be able to take um, a big, long pipeline like this, where you've got, you know, a bunch of uh, a bunch of these um, uh, functional operators on enumerations, like select and map, that you've stacked together this way, and stick the pipeline uh, attribute in front of it, and have it turn into something like this a single loop, which does the same thing, but doesn't have all these blocks and stuff in it. Just has a single loop body, and should act, execute faster than this would. Um, I have, let's see, I have a, another couple of interesting macros to show you. Do I have time? Yeah, I think I get time here. Um, so, all right. I don't want to show that one first. I want to show this one. So this is a loop unroller. It takes the body of the loop and uh, multiplies it. So uh, I think currently I'm using four as the loop multiplier. So your loop body, um, if, if you've got less than four uh, iterations through your loop, it'll just be expanded into four versions of your loop body. If you've got more than that, there'll be four versions um, and um, a loop with, with four versions in it. Um, and um, because Ruby has a bunch of different types of loops, there's a number of, of special cases in this. Um, there's probably more I can do here, but, but right now all I'm uh, trying to implement are the, uh, the while and until uh, loop, loop types and um, uh, the, the times loop. So, uh, and, and then the way you use this is you, you stick an unroll in front of, of your loop. Now this is, I'm not going to try to explain all this code, but notice this macro is about two pages worth of code. That's, it's kind of complicated, but it's not too bad. Um, you can actually do a lot of stuff in not a whole lot of, of, of space with, with this. Um, it continuously surprises me about Ruby. It's, how much really 
cool stuff you can do with, with not very much code. Uh, something you thought would be really complicated and ends up being something that will fit the, on one screen. Um, and my other macro that I, I okay. The other macro I really like, I just got this one working recently. This is an inliner. Um, if you stick the inline keyword at the, uh, at the beginning of a method call, at the beginning of a method definition, it will turn that into an inline method, uh, which is um, which basically an inline method is sort of a specialized version of a macro. So what, how this macro actually works is it turns your method definition into uh, the equivalent macro definition. Um, and then that, that is uh, expanded uh, by subsequent stage of the macro processor. Um, so I think I've got enough time. I can actually demonstrate how some of this stuff works. Um, so this is how you would declare an inline method. Um, let's give it a parameter. Um, let's let it do something simple like Now that's actually created a macro for you in the background called foo, um, and then you could invoke it like this. And as you can see, it has the same semantics as the equivalent method would have. Um, now, maybe I cheated. Maybe I didn't actually implement an inline macro. I'm just using a regular method call. So let's show you how that works. So. Um, uh, one of the features of macros is this macro.expand method, which lets you um, see what your macro definition or expansion or form or whatever looks like in, when it's turned into regular code. So uh, foo of four, let's see how that expands. It's turned into, uh, I forgot I don't have history. It's turned into this parse tree, and we could try to interpret that, but what I like to do is just unparse them, uh, which takes a parse tree and turns it back into a string. Um, and as you can see, what I've ended up doing here is uh, this four got inlined into the method definition, and the whole method got inlined into its caller. And there's some extra stuff going on here. It's a little bit cl clunky, but um, you know, basically, it's an inline method. Um, this is something that's, as, as far as I'm aware, nobody has done this before in Ruby. Uh, and maybe if time real quickly, I can show you the unroll working as well. Sometimes the parser is kind of slow. Well, while we're waiting, does anybody have any questions they want to ask? Yes. Uh, it, it mutates it twice. So basically, uh, you know, what you would probably want in most cases is you'd want to have that side effect happen only once. Um, but there may be cases where you, where you do want the side effects to happen more than once. Um, so that, that's something you need to be aware of when you're doing this, is, is that, uh, um, and, and incidentally, that's, that's currently a problem with my inline macros. It doesn't handle that case properly. You know, inline should preserve the original semantics of the method call. Um, you know, so I should be um, evaluating it once and storing it in the variable, and then um, uh, and then using that. Um, well, 
Uh, any more, any other questions? Yes, it should be a complete parser for Ruby, as far as I'm aware. There may be a little corner or two that I haven't discovered yet, um, but it should parse the complete, la the, the complete Ruby 1.8 language. Uh, some of the new 1.9 constructions I can't do. Um, it, at the moment, it is not possible to use macros to create new types of tokens. Um, you have to use the existing token definitions. Um, I wrote a tokenizer as well, and it's fairly easy for me to extend that to new types of tokens, but probably other people, it's not so easy. Um, that is a feature of Lisp. It has these things called lexical macros. Um, it'd be nice to be able to do that. I think I'm out of time, Mike. Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody.